So, David, you'll give me over. So, uh, yeah, topic is Active Directory ain't going anywhere, so we might as well secure it. Uh, just a brief introduction about myself. So, I'm Eric Woodruff. I work for a company, Sempris. We do a lot of Active Directory, Enter ID, which was Azure ID, uh, security stuff. Um, you know, as we go through this today, in particular, a lot of the things I'll be covering are sort of like the short list, easy win. Um, you both make software to protect the Active Directory, so so we sort of have research folks that are, are looking at, you know, sort of things that are going on out there. And we also have an incident response team that only focuses on AD, so this is also informed on, you know, what we see in the industry, what we see ourselves, and and all that good stuff. Uh, social media handles, you want to reach out to me, Eric and Identity. You know, it's pretty easy to remember when I'm Eric. I'm going to be, uh, make my own slides, come in branding. So I figure if I fail, so I have security. I have a branding here. So, right, so basically, we're going to just talk about why active directory security is important. And then again, sort of quick wins for securing uh, AD. Well, before we get into things here, so I actually live in uh, New York, not New York City, but I'm in the Northeast, and I uh, love going up to Katy National Park, Maine. Uh, if you like hiking outdoors, anything like that, it's, it's beautiful up here. Um, and this one hike, Precipice Trail, it might be hard to tell, but if you sort of go up of the, the right where it's green, right, that's basically like falling your death um, on this particular hike, right? And so at the foot of the trail, We've got a uh, warning sign here, right? Um, basically telling us, right, if we, uh, you know, stay on the trail, don't hike if it's raining or snowing or dark out, right? Wear our hiking boots, uh, you know, don't do dumb things, basically, right? We'll, we'll probably survive the hike, um, but, but you will see people still hiking in, like, their crocs and all sorts of stuff. But, you know, I kind of like to think of this almost as, like, defensive death, right? Because as long as we do most of those things, like, if it's not snowing, but I'm wearing my crocs, like, it's... You know, I still have a high chance of actually surviving uh, the hike here. And, right, so another way we like to talk about defensive death, right, is this onion model here. Um, and we really can apply this, you know, to, to anything, right? And so in this case, active directory is sort of in the center of things. Um, Right. When you see the more classic defense and depth models, all the different ways you're using the physical, perimeter, and network, all with your data in the middle here. But we can really apply this thinking to anything, right? And I kind of like this over like zero trust beyond that being like, you know, a drinking game and buzzword thing. Um, but in many ways, they're actually very similar. And I think defense and depth sort of models, right, are just easier to comprehend. I mean, ultimately, again, everything that we're going to talk about today is sort of compensating controls, right, for trying to uh, protect the AD. Ultimately, right, it's not that everything's going to be bulletproof, but we're trying to create as much friction for the attackers so that they're going to sort of go elsewhere. Now, this is a bit marketing, but I'm like an identity guy, and I will say that, right, this, this is true with identity being the, the new security perimeter, but it's actually not really new. Um, for another presentation I, I've given, I actually looked up and found that someone sort of coined this term in the, uh, the beginning of 2012, right? So now we're going on like 12 years of saying identity is the, the new security perimeter, um, right? Or the identity perimeter, however you want to put it. Uh, the only sort of slide I, I stole this picture from work because I didn't feel like making it from lazy. Right? But ultimately, especially with COVID, right, everything is, you know, work from home. You know, we've got Google Workspace and Office 365, and all of our employees now, right, are trained to want everything from everywhere all the time. They want it easy, right? And we've got vendors and contractors and MSPs and CSPs, all those people, right, wanting to come in and help us with everything. And, you know, everything is SAS, right? Which is all like great, but now where we used to just right, we wrap a firewall around things, maybe we have a BlackBerry dev server or whatnot. Um, well, for the most part, right, that was the sort of old perimeter that we were dealing with. Uh, not so much anymore. And we also deal with this thing uh, right, called hybrid identity, again, for a lot of organizations, right, whether in your, you know, Google Workspace or Office 365, right, you've got all your on-prem stuff with your Active Directory and or your on-prem things, right, but we're introducing, again, the cloud here, right, and you're going to have your Enter ID, and, you know, Office 365 and, you know, Azure and all these things, right? And we, we plumb this up in the 
you know, sort of Microsoft ecosystem with this Azure Connect server, right? And it, it's all great because, again, from a business perspective, right, this enables us to sort of get all those SaaS applications that that everyone loves, right? But as, as we sort of build this out, right, the problem is is that if Active Directory becomes compromised, right, it's actually very easy for a attacker to not only compromise what is you know in your on-prem estate. What also move laterally to, uh, you know, enter ID here, right? And then basically start compromising all of your, your uh, you know, SaaS applications there, right? And and I'll just say again, like you see in the news where people are like, we're leaving the cloud and all this stuff. I mean, one of my favorite articles about this um, was written a year and a half ago with this guy at his company, I think it's uh, King.com. He's like, for CTA, I was like, we're leaving AWS because it's too expensive. Um, they offer a, a SaaS application for email, right? So even though we talk about like leaving the cloud, right? From a team perspective, it, it's we're not leaving all these SaaS apps, right? Nobody's running Workday or Salesforce or Box or something like that on premise, right? So the whole you know hybrid identity situation that we're seeing, it, it's it's not going anywhere. And yeah, the little little sort of cliche with some of these things that are saying, but they're also true, right? Is, um, so this is Alex Weiner, he's VP of uh, Identity Security at Microsoft, right? And, you know, Yuri's quoting saying attacks were like ransomware are the second stage predicated by an identity compromise, right? And so again, if you look at the news um, and you see a lot of the attacks out there, right? It's usually um, many times actually not something that is super complex. Uh, right, there was, I think, one of the, the simpler things in the past year or so was one of the, the many Fortinet bugs um, where it was integrated, right, LDAP with Active Directory. And in one of those instances, the like service account for Fortinet is a domain admin. So it was like, right, super simple for the attacker to not have to do much that's, you know, nothing complex once they got on the network, right? They just sort of popped in the AD and but again, you can see here that if we look at a lot of the headlines, right? So here's, um, you know, an article side reason that ICP malware compromised Active Directory domain and lost the day, right? The whole MGM break shit was going on, which also had a bit of an off the component in this, right? But they went after identity systems. Um, here's a, you know, multinational tech firm, ADD, if I black box uh, ransomware attack, and right, you could go on and on. Um, but I'll actually give a pitch for this, this sort of short-lived uh, series. It's a podcast with ransomware files. And um, if you've never listened to it or, you know, you just like podcasts or whatnot, uh, I think check it out. Uh, I think the guy won some awards for this. But the thing I always found interesting is uh, in pretty much every single episode of this, it's like Active Directory is compromised and then the whole ransomware thing happens, right? So... Um, so I think we all sort of understand right, why you need to secure active directory. So, you know, now we'll get into, it's, it's a bit dry, right? But we'll, we'll try to keep it sort of lively here, right? Securing active directory, the things that are sort of those, those short uh, wins of the quick list for us right here. Um, so we want to implement strong identity processes. And, and this one is one that I, I just said, there's going to be quick wins, but um, right, this can turn very complex. Uh, but really, here we're talking about like your, you know, management and the life cycle of your privileged users, in particular, like your domain admins, right? And so, um, you know, one of the problems that we'll actually see at organizations is you can have all this robust HR stuff going on, right? Someone who leaves the organization, uh, and then their privilege credentials aren't actually disabled because they're not within that sort of HR life cycle thing, right? So. Um, you know, unfortunately, right, like your your IT admins may not be your security people, right, a lot of time infrastructure owns active directory still. Um, well, we want to make sure, right, for like domain admins, at least that when those people leave the organization, that their accounts are getting canned, right? If we don't have a process to sort of account for this, like, we need to build something, right? This could easily turn into like a very long, drawn out identity governance um, project, right, but we can also start small, right? A lot of organizations, um, you know, it, it's as much like a culture change amongst whoever owns Active Directory, right? To sort of implement these processes. 
Um, you're getting a bit more technical here. Uh, we want to make sure if we have a forest, right? So Active Directory Forest, and it's like, right, the forest is starting with the security boundary. You can have Forest A, you can have Forest B. Then we can set a trust relationship up between these two forests. Um, but there are some sort of things we want to watch out for here. And right, a lot of times forests will come out of, you know, mergers and acquisitions or, you know, just... I worked at a place where we had a lot of, um, I was in the public sector for 15 years and there's a lot of infighting um, because it's it's public sector. And so there's a lot of active directory domains and forests because they everyone wanted to have their own little fight done. And eventually we sort of all brought these things together with, with forest uh, trust, right? But with trust, there's a thing within active directory, which is your SID, right? This is basically a security identifier for who you are. And there's a functionality in Active Directory called SID history, where um, if you've gone through a migration or whatnot, you can basically keep a list of you know the former SIDs that your you know user account had, right? Because our users aren't typing some long unique string in; they're typing in right, their UPN or their SAM account name, something simple. Right? I've been in Eric, right, as my username, not some long string. So with um, Forest, though, and SID history, what we can potentially have is if, like, I made a guest right in another forest and there's someone that is interesting over there, you can potentially copy, right, that interesting person's SID in your SID history if you have the right privileges and, you know, sort of impersonate this person, right? So we want to... Um, Actually, I should have looked at my slides because I'll, I'll speak backwards here. That we want to make sure that we have SID filtering um, enabled across our forest trust, right, to sort of protect against this. Um, and it's a bit more uh, difficult at times. But in certain scenarios, we'll have like a very untrusted sort of forest, right, and we'll have a very trusted forest. And perhaps in the very trusted forest, we only want to let people get to certain things. Uh, that's where selective authentication can come in, right? If there's like only one thing in this forest you want people to actually use, right? You set up your forest trust, and then with selective auth, we can say like people can only use this one thing, right? It's not necessarily like a free for all uh, within the uh, the two forests there, right? And again, a lot of the stuff as we go through it is stuff that you know we've sort of seen out there as sort of post incident with um, things that organizations were. Um, but I don't want to say doing the wrong, right? Because a lot of times, again, a little time to find is IP pros, right? Trying to get stuff done back in my <laughs> uh, days. Uh, there was a, a fellow I worked with, very nice guy. Uh, we had more than one incident where um, something wasn't working, right? And all of a sudden, it's like full control, of, right? Until whatever is working is working, right? Because you needed to get something done. Uh, unfortunately, when those situations happened, Nobody <laughs> ever sort of goes back and actually tries to figure out what was really required from a permission perspective, right? Which was like on to the, the next thing. So it's here in Kerberos, right? Um, you know, we want to make sure that we rotate the uh, KRV PTT uh, account password. And so in particular, right, this is sort of like the thing that is used in like, um, you know, the little picket attacks and, and whatnot. Uh, we should rotate this, you know, at least twice a year or if someone, again, that had, like, domain admin privileges leaves the organization, um, right? And some of this gets into these these things where we're asked by customers a lot, like, I want to protect against a golden ticket and Kerberos thing and all these things. And, and honestly, some of it boils down to, um, right, either behavior where you've already been compromised. Like, if someone can really get the Caribbean PGT password at that point, you're pretty much... Uh, not in a good place. Um, right, so some of the other steps that we want to make sure that we're securing Kerberos is doing things like eliminating unconstrained delegations. Right? Unconstrained delegation, again, within Active Directory, there's a model where you can say, right, like a, a service or a system can essentially impersonate other users, right? So, um, you know, you can have a web service with SQL or something like that, and maybe you have certain permissions set in that. When you tell like IIS or whatnot, right, that it can impersonate users, um, right, to sort of have access to certain things within that database. Um, but unconstrained delegation lets you impersonate basically anyone within Active Directory. Again, domain admins, right? This IIS server that was probably incorrectly configured with this is going to be outside of that sort of, you know, tier zero protection, right, doing whatever its IIS things are, um, but also like, a malicious person to move to it and uh, sort of go on from there. 
Um, and also, you know, a, a quicker win is, um, you know, service principal uh, names, right? So SPNs or SPINs, uh, again, assigned to your domain admins in particular, right? So uh, with accounts that have a service principal name assigned to them, they're basically primed to be curb roasted, right? Which again, sort of long story short, is with curb roasting, right? Um, if you request a service ticket for an account that has an SPN set on it, uh, effectively the, the ticket, um, is encrypted with the hash or the password, right? So you can go take that hash and get your crack and rig thing out, and over time, right, you're effectively, you're, you're likely going to determine what the user's password was, right? There's other things you can do, like having strong password policies, but, right, why why give the person a, a, a chance here, right? In, in most scenarios, there isn't actually a need to have these things set. Again, we'll see, right, someone was trying something because something didn't work, so it's like, let's just do all the things until that, the service works. So, so when we talk about you know deterring lateral movement here, right? Some of this stuff is that you know before we get onto our domain controllers, right? I know this one is a pain is removing local administrator, um, right, uh, from our end users, right? But if we can not have our end users be a local admin, or if we can you know, implement a PM solution, right, where they have to sort of go through a process that only temporarily have local administrator. But it's, it's really helping reduce that foothold on those devices for people who move around. Um, and also LAPS, right? So LAPS, right, Windows functionality, where basically the local administrator password is not known. Um, again, back to my PubSec days, we were not using LAPS. Well, one of the districts in the, the public sector realm where I worked was not using LAPS. All the devices had the same password set on them for a local administrator. Um, it didn't compromise AD, but there was ransomware sort of going around and right, sort of just spread to every device uh, within their sort of district. So still was not a, a super fun time for it. So kind of moving in here to, to secure and privilege users and groups, right? And, and again, some of this may seem uh, a bit straightforward, right? But unfortunately, this is the stuff that, um, you know, we, we tend to not actually see followed in organizations, right? So limiting those, those privileged service accounts, right? And this could be something like uh, a decade ago or something, maybe your backup software and your domain admin. Um, if, probably does not these days or may not these days, right? Or if it does, right, see if, you know, the Active Directory recycling bin can sort of suffice for some of the things you may want to score. Right? But, you know, back to the Fortinet thing, right? Uh, where a firewall has an account that has to be an admin, right? It just, it, it's uh, a lot of things where it just, unfortunately, um, you know, our, our IP pros do not have the, the sort of oversight or forethought as to what they're doing here. Right? Identity is difficult. A lot of people don't fully understand what they're doing here in the directory. Unfortunately, manage it. Um, but also monitor for movement for permission changes on the admin SD holder object. And so admin SD holder is effectively a thing, um, and we'll sort of keep a higher level, right? That sets the permissions on your privileged users, so your domain admins and other privileged, uh, you know, um, user groups uh, or types of users in um, right, Active Directory. Uh, and again, what we'll see is like admin SD holder, because someone's been trying to do something where, right, um, we're rolling out, I don't know, some self service password reset uh, software across the organization. And sort of unfortunately, right, thinking, you know, like wondering why this, this service can't impact our domain admins or other privileged users. Um, and what organizations will do is they'll go to change the permissions on admin SD holder. Because effectively, like if I go try to like say, you know, give uh, you know, John or something uh, full control over a domain admin, we'll find out like sometime within the next hour that that permission will be reverted because it's not stamped on admin SD holder. Where the process goes through, it sort of compares what's on our privileged users to this. And it's like, wait, this isn't right. Like, let me go flip it back. Um, but back to like things like self-service password reset, right? What we'll find then is like they go on through and, and set those permissions on admin SD holder. Um, but you'll see wacky stuff like you know the service desk will have permissions to reset domain admin passwords, right? And now all of a sudden your service desk is like basically also domain administrator. And a lot of this gets into defining Q0, which is as much of sort of like a, a business exercise and than anything that's necessarily technical. 
Or so if, if you've been around the block for Active Directory or with Active Directory for a little while, um, or you've probably sort of seen the diagram like this, right, where we have our tier zero, tier one, and tier two. Uh, now, Microsoft has changed this, but um, with the, the enterprise uh, access security model or something like that, but, but honestly, this still works quite well, right, when we're talking about Active Directory security. But unfortunately, it's a bit dated, right, in um, what we're actually including within tier zero here these days, right? So the real tier zero is not just our domain admins and our domain controllers and our privilege access workstations, right? Which hopefully we're, we're using is stay within that horizontal plane. Right, we expand this a bit, right? With things like ADFS and Active Directory Certificate Services, right? Now we, we find there's a lot of attacks on ADCS in particular, where um, if you think people don't know Active Directory, well, try and go through a bunch of IT pros and you know, manage PKI, and it's just like a complete nightmare. Um, there's so many ways that organizations can get attacked through their certificate services, right? And effectively, again, an attack can move up uh, and impersonate you know, domain controllers, impersonate domain admins, right? From all this stuff that we're, we're implementing as we're trying to be more secure and really we're sort of you know, shooting ourselves in the foot. Um, also, interconnect, or if you're using Okta, right, or Okta agent, or whatever it's called. Um, if you have hybrid identity systems, these things are also, right, tier zero. Um, they're one of the things that, again, can be used to not only sort of move out into, uh, you know, Active Directory, right, because this thing likely is highly privileged, um, but also move into, you know, your Azure Active Directory entry ID as well. Right, and this goes a bit further. These days, where we can talk about things like your backup system. Again, right, if you're backing up your domain controllers into your Convolve or your rubric or whatnot, it's like great. But also, just remember, right, whoever has access to those backups, I mean, one, the backup right would be sort of taken off the system and someone could start, you know, going at the, the disk image or the, the contents of their DCs. But what we've seen, again, and I, I worked at Nord where our, our Convolve, right, back in the day, before I'm better, I suppose, uh, had uh, a service account that had domain admin, right? Nobody's thinking about the fact that basically now all of our, our convo, uh, you know, admins are also effectively, uh, you know, indirectly domain administrators. Um, and, you know, one that I think is more interesting now is the, the management plane, right? So in here, I have Azure. Um, unfortunately, my layout is uh, not working um, well today uh because i was going to have a very quick uh, demonstration here sort of on the management plane thing but instead of, i'll just sort of walk through this right and see why the management plane is now also becoming a uh, sort of a tag vector in way that um, threat actors can actually move into active directory and this isn't like theory um many in particular has seen um, organizations from their IR uh breach because <laughs> kind of like cloud platforms have been used to gain a football into an active directory. Right. So some of this, you know, we, we define things. Um sometimes also when we're protecting our Q0, right? We actually need to map our attack paths like this, right? Uh you know, using like Bloodhound, um, you know, other tools like Catalanch or Forest Druid or whatnot, right? A both free commercial software, right? But uh, and I say this where one of you know probably more offensive or, or security oriented oriented people, but what I can find difficult in a lot of organizations is right, like because their XDR platform will, um, you know, flag Bloodhound as like malware or something like that. Right? A lot of blue folks, a lot of IT pros think it's like bad, right? They think it's only like hackery things. When in reality, a lot of stuff we talk about, the complexities of how, right, the business is sort of uh, implemented at that directory can easily sort of be figured out and, and distilled down when we use these tools. Um, and we do also want to follow the clean source principle Right. So this again sort of goes back to the diagram here of, in particular, I'd say implementing privilege access workstations. Um, you know, with the PubSec stuff again, when we were implementing POA, uh, nobody really um, liked me because the people that worked for me were not happy that I was having them use a different workstation for um, right, what they're doing within uh, Active Directory. But, uh, privilege access access workstations, it's really like a culture change thing, right? And it's as simple as saying, like, hey, right, like, 
you want to be the person who is the reason why we're like, you know, going to pay for whatnot. Um, we actually had a red team come in and I don't know, within like 10 or 15 minutes, they had their main admin. So that was sort of like the like, oh, like, right. This is why we want to use things like privilege access workstations. But again, it's why we want to make sure, right, within this sort of horizontal, that any sort of target resource, right, so Active Directory or VCs, um, we're accessing it from a device such as a privilege access workstation that's on that same plane, right? If you sort of were down into the workstation admins, the, the sort of, you know, general user tier there, right? Those are the devices where we're browsing Instagram and Amazon and all these things and reading our personal email and we're just... Right, sort of setting ourselves up to be compromised there, and then an attacker can easily sort of move on up. Again, uh, so the management plane here, right? So for a management plane attack, um, if we have, you know, our, say, our not or soft person or something here, right? Um, for a lot of organizations out in Azure, they may have certain rights to virtual machines to say, stop and start them, you know, do basic things, right? So that if something is going wrong on the weekend, right, whoever's working that sort of shift can easily go in and, you know, restart the server, right? It's still Windows, so, you know, the first sort of fix for something going wrong is to reboot it, right? Um, so they're given access to a subscription or several subscriptions for management groups or something like that. And we give them, like, reader and virtual machine contributor rights, now, these don't actually say that they can, like, log in, right? They can't already be in this Windows server or this domain controller in particular, but it gives them certain rights over that, right? So if we have that domain controller out there running as a VM, um, they have, when these set the rights, the ability to use a run command. And this is a thing that, you know, was open to demo, but it takes, like, <laughs> five seconds, 15 seconds, uh, within half a minute, right? So the run command window basically lets you run anything as a system on a Windows VM, and the agent for it is required on every you know virtual machine that's running in Azure. Um, similarly, Microsoft is pushing Azure Arc, which is sort of extending the management plane of Azure, having like on-prem stuff or in the US or GCP, uh, or wherever you want to host you know servers, whether they're physical or virtual. Um, and very similar, uh, you can sort of do the same attack through uh, the ARC agent. Um, so while I don't have uh, the demo here today, I actually had like a half an hour session that sort of dives into the details here at, um, there was a, a virtual summit Microsoft did for server 2025 coming out. So if you go to that uh, URL and look for protecting active directory for management plane attacks, I get more into sort of how we remediate these things um, from like an RDAC perspective and try to, you know, protect our, our DCs. Right. We're also hardening our domain controllers, right? So we want to do things like disable unnecessary services, right? Uh, print errors, a big thing where the print schooler, you know, historically has had problems with, you know, uh, RC and whatnot over the years, right? We can disable these things. And again, it's a quick win, uh, right, for most organizations. Uh, you know, removing unnecessary roles, right? Again, it's, it's amazing. You can walk into an org and see the stuff that they're running uh, on domain controllers, or even like they'll want to try to shortcut things and they'll be like, well, you know, we want to run Enter Connect, or we want to run Active Directory Certificate Services, or can we run ADFS, right? Or, like they, they, they want like the Active Directory appliance. Um, and while all those things may still be tier zero, right, it, it's it's reducing the impact surface, right, that at least for moving those roles and, and putting them on other systems. Um, you know, and unnecessary agents, right? Again, this is one of those things where uh, at times, you may see something like if it's a light uh, management system, right? If we're going back from, you know, actual physical iron or something like that, where again, there may be agents because we want that, that painting glass, right? And in some of these instances, again, that agent may have, you know, system rights or something that may seem innocuous, but effectively, whoever's managing our HP lights out management system right now is also a, a domain adder. Um, you know, in applying parking policies, and this one is, again, a bit difficult in that, um, you know, I will say it's difficult, but what we'll tend to see is, um, you know, everyone wants everything, like, it's, it's all or nothing, right? So if you look at, like, a CIS uh, control or, you know, Microsoft Security Compliance Toolkit or this, this big hardening policies for domain controllers, right, um, we'll, we'll tend to look at it very black and white, like, we can't do all the things. 
right? Because the hardened policy maybe is the same like NTLM, you know, V2, and it's just like, it, right, really what we still have stuff that needs NTLM and whatnot. Um, or so we'll choose to just be like, well, we're just not going to do anything, right? We're not going to apply any of that. Um, but right instead, like when we're talking about reducing that attack surface, well, if like we can harden the DC like 90% of the way, right, and it really has an impact on anything, like let's do that. And I, and I think that's both a shift sort of in, you know, the, the security world and with IP pros, because, uh, you know, I've, I've seen challenges certainly where some organizations will be like, we're not going to do any identity security, right, because um, we can't like hit 100%. And we need to look at it more as like an iterative process, right? A lot of what we're talking about here is even somewhat iterative, right? It, it's more like, let's go through, find the quick wins, all right, round two, round three, instead of these waterfall approaches of like, let's harden the active directory, and we're gonna go right have our active directory security assessment, and then we're just gonna sit on everything, right, until we can like get rid of NTLM. Um, and also monitoring for, for unusual activity, right? And so this gets into the, the term out there, we get the threat detection response, which, um, you know, I'm just going to leave it at this in that you can find if you're a Microsoft customer, if you have M365 licensing, you may have Defender for Identity, right? There's also a lot of free tools and vendor driven tools that are sort of in this space. Uh, you know, I mean, I work for a software company that, right, sort of lives in this realm, but I also know, right, name acronyms and everything, um, you know, can always be a, a thing that people hate or um, well, hate less. Uh, but where I'd say this is evolving from like your SIF or your scene, or whatever you want to put it right, is that these identity attacks in other ways though are um they're not always easy to have a, a SOC, right? Sort of understand what's going on. Um and right, identity is just tough, it's challenging. A lot of security people, unless you live in identity, right? It can be very difficult to understand what is a false positive, how to tune this sort of stuff. Um, there's been other sessions I've seen at conferences given about sort of, you know, SOC going out. And one of the things in particular gets into this whole, like, where we're just getting bombarded constantly with, like, you know, identity alerts and, you know, our active directory team is telling us to ignore it, right? And it's just creating all this sort of unnecessary burden. And so, you know, I'd say with any of these things, it's really trying to both, um, you know, from a proactive perspective, give you more prescriptive guidance on how to secure you know, your active directory, but also from like a, a detection perspective, right? Um, in a lot of these systems, the sort of intelligence behind it is built more by you know active directory or identity, you know, securing people. Who we're trying to balance, right? Um, not just giving everyone a, a headache. Um, you know, the last bit here is you know testing your active directory for recovery. So. You know, one of the other things that we see, though, is organizations, well, unfortunately, have not done all the other things, and, you know, the ransomware, and, you know, active directories, and tank, um, and they haven't actually tested restoring AD, and, right, for a lot of boards that have active directory, if active directory is down for two weeks, well, then the whole business is down for two weeks, right? There's companies that have, like, literally gone out of business because they could not recover, right, active directory, and subsequently, like, nothing else uh, was functioning the functioning in the organization. Um, you know, the, the folks that manage your AD uh, may say that they've tested this, or they may be like, yeah, you know, we've we've got a backup, or ready right are using Cobalt or Rubric or something like that, which is all great. But how do you actually go on through the process of you know going through that that tabletop and well, not even the tabletop exercise, a real exercise, and right, standing up a lab, seeing how long it would take to actually restore a directory to where it's it's usable and, and functional within the, the organization, right? Because most people uh, and organizations do not do this, right? It's not within sort of DRP. Yeah. When you're doing that restore, is there a way to tell it, restore, you know, these limited users first so that we can get these really critical people to log in and do their jobs and then restore everybody else in the background or is it kind of back to do it all at once? So, so I would say, I mean, generally it's all at once, but the, the, the more difficult part is not so much like determining the, the users that need to be restored. Um, I mean, unless like we're talking like a, a very large enterprise with like share for million user objects, um, you know, really the issue is more the, the infrastructure of active directory getting it, getting it stood back up from that recovery. Um, 
and many times, I mean, if, if we were restoring it, it would be in like, you know, uh, an isolated environment where we might focus on connecting critical apps, but um, yeah, it's more like getting the infrastructure up. And it, it could be even things like, right, our end control three, we're a global company, um, right? Well, we're going to test our restore in the U.S., but what about like all the stuff that's running in Europe or something like that? And if we have to stay in the back of directory here or there, right, how do we do this? How do we keep it isolated? Because also in many IR cases, um, best case scenario, you're trying to sort of restore active directory while other IR people are right, trying to do forensics on like what went wrong and you want to make sure right that the threat actor still isn't like hanging out somewhere before you sort of reconnect that AD. So, um, yeah, the, the recovery piece is really as much, it, it's really focusing on like, getting the infrastructure of Active Directory stood up. And again, right, not just like me restoring a VM on like, my desktop and being like, yeah, you know, like it worked. Right. And I know it's kind of like a consultant, like it depends on answer answer, but, um, you know, so last thing is, I, I want to touch on here again from Microsoft. So, so they released their uh, digital defense report uh, for 2023 at the beginning of this year. I don't expect any of you to read any of this very small text on the screen. Um, the focus is really in this return on mitigation, right? And so uh, a lot of the, the, the content within this report from Microsoft comes from their own IR team, uh, which was previously dark. And I think it's just Microsoft instant response, right? So when... You know, you have an incident, if you were to call them Microsoft, have them come in, right? Uh, a lot of that data that they've seen sort of funnels up into this digital defense report. And the return on mitigation is effectively looking at, like, okay, what security controls can we implement that have, like, a high return on value, right? That they're, they have a high return on, you know, making it more difficult for an attacker to sort of, like, right, compromise Active Directory. But they're not necessarily the, the most... Um, you know, complex thing, right? Because you can start to talk about like implementing like privilege access management and other things, which are great, right? But sometimes identity protection stuff can also have a very large, you know, uplift to actually get these things implemented. So you know, there, there's a lot sort of going on on the screen, but what I really just wanted to highlight, if, if you can sort of see as it, uh, you know, animates in, is really everything that we talked about today falls under that high return on mitigation, right? So, um, you know, all these quick wins kind of align, right, from what we're seeing um, to, you know, what Microsoft also is basically saying will help sort of give you those those quick wins for, for conducting the game. Um, any questions? Any questions? Um, yeah. When it comes to uh, like workstation, for instance, yeah. how do you socialize it with your vendor uh, you know, teams, you know, to help them lock that stuff down so that you don't have users who don't need workstation admin with workstation admin? Yeah, I mean that's a good question, <laughs> and it's also one where it's like a, it depends. I mean, right, like. Um, I guess I'll say, unfortunately, you'll see that, like, I think people are not great at dog fooding, where, like, right, we, we should, like, do what we tell our people, we're, like, the worst at it. Um, you know, for some orgs, it, it has to sort of, you, you get into sort of profiling, right, your devices out there. Uh, you know, it kind of depends on who manages workstations and, and you know, client devices in the org. Um, right, if they're running something like, you know, SCCM or other, you know, endpoint management software, they might be able to sort of write profile the software that's installed. And, and usually many times you can go from there, right, to try to get, like, ideas and, and patterns and behavior around your end users, um, right, of, like, what are you installing? What are they installing? Right, if they have local admin, how do you sort of, like, figure out, a, a, you know, a nice compromise there? Um, Right, because some, some organizations, unfortunately, it's been a long time where people are just used to being able to do whatever they want. Um, and some of that gets into organizational change management, which is like having to build the awareness and desire for your users to sort of like realize that right, we're not taking away a local administrator because we hate you and we want you to just like not like your job anymore, right? It's because there's these things, right? You've seen software that you use that maybe, you know, has had a lot of um, you know, bugs in it, things like that. I mean, just, you know, it, it easily sort of, I could grab a hole on it, blah, blah. Anything else?